Well, you know, Israel-Palestine conflict is one of the simpler ones in the world. There are some conflicts where it's really hard to think of a sensible solution, uh, or at least even sensible progress, like Kashmir, for example, or Eastern Congo. I mean, really serious conflicts. In the case of Israel-Palestine, there's a settlement right on the table. It's been there for 35 years. There's overwhelming international support for it, virtually un unanimous. That's a two-state settlement on the international border with some rectification of the borders, uh, minor and mutual modification. It's the official U.S. term during the period when the U.S. was still part of the world on this issue. Uh, that's uh, been pretty much the case for 35 years. It can't get anywhere because the U.S. and Israel block it. Now, the U U.S. first vetoed a resolution to this effect, the Security Council in 1976, and it continues through that, rarely even gets reported. Uh, sometimes it gets reported for in, in February 2011, the latest U.S. veto. It was so outlandish that it did raise some eyebrows. Obama vetoed a Security Council resolution uh, which supported official U.S. policy. It called for uh, termination of uh, settlement expansion. That's technically U.S. policy, but Obama vetoed it. Uh, and uh, uh, as long as this continues, there's not going to be a settlement. Uh, but, and in fact, you can see what's happening. I mean, Israel and the U.S. are carrying out a systematic program, step-by-step, uh, -step, well planned, implemented by Israel, mostly funded and given other kinds of backing by the U.S. Now, the program is a variant of what was called the Sharon Plan, but it goes back pretty much to the early days after 1967. Uh, take over whatever is valuable in the West Bank, but not the population, so there won't be any what's called demographic problem, problem of too many Arabs in a Jewish state. So just take over the, and it's very clear, uh, take over everything uh, with behind the, what's called the separation wall, actually an annexation wall that takes a substantial, valuable part of the West Bank and it will sooner or later be annexed Israel. Uh, take over Greater Jerusalem, which is a vastly expanded area way beyond what Jerusalem was. Uh, take over the Jordan Valley. That began in 1970. It goes slowly and quietly because it doesn't look nice if the world sees it, but it's happening systematically. There's a recent Oxfam report about it, uh, B'Tselem report, the main human rights group in Israel. Drive out the Palestinians. It's a very fertile land, a lot of water. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, unsettled in the Jewish areas. Uh, and then establish uh, uh, salients that cut through the West Bank. So there's one to the east of Jerusalem, which goes almost to Jericho, pretty much bisects the West Bank, includes a big town, Maal al-Dumim, which was built in the middle to try to separate the two parts of the West Bank. And another salient uh, to the north goes through the town of Ariel, a couple of others. It leaves the Palestinians in essentially pretty near isolated cantons. Uh, but the air, and of course there's a huge infrastructure development so that uh, uh, Israelis and visitors can travel from Mala Dumim to Tel Aviv without ever seeing an Arab, you know. And, uh, and the, the, the areas near the border are basically the nice suburbs of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, so you keep those. And there where a lot of the water is and so on and so forth. And so just continue with that. Uh, and uh, that's the one alternative to a two-state settlement. There's a lot of talk about a one-state settlement, but that's a non-starter. Uh, Israel won't accept it. The U.S. won't accept it. Nobody else in the world will accept it. Uh, so at calling for it is just uh, supporting indirectly supporting the U.S.-Israeli policies of um, implementing a version of the Sharon Plan. Well, that's what's happening. Uh, 
Of course, Gaza is kept as a prison. The Golan Heights, which was annexed over the direct orders in violation of the direct orders of the Security Council, practically not talked about. And uh, that's uh, essentially what's being implemented. And it'll continue that way as long as the U.S. is the dominant part, mm -hmm. as long as the U.S. doesn't change its policies. Mm -hmm. That's the one weak point in the system. Mm -hmm. What strategies should we use? I mean, I know that the one-state solution is all talked a lot about within the... Well, that's just... That's for academic seminars. I mean, there's, there's no... The only proposal that I know of to move towards what's called the one-state solution, a binational state, the only proposal that I know of is in stages, beginning with a two-state settlement, and then uh, you can sketch out ways in which you could progress beyond. There's, there's just no other proposal. So when people talk about it without a proposal as to how to get from here to there, it's just, it's kind of like a philosophy seminar. Fine, you, know, you want to talk about it, okay, but it has no relation to what's happening on the ground. Uh, there are tactics that can be employed. Uh, one of them, which can be used effectively, is what's now called BDS, a variety of tactics, which can be applied and can be applied very effectively. Uh, has to, you have to think through the tactics. Uh, there's often an analogy made to South Africa, dubious analogy. But in the case of South Africa, there never was a BDS movement. Uh, the tactics were used, uh, adjusted to circumstances, often effectively. Uh, but it, it's not a kind of like a doctrine that you apply blindly, like all tactics. You have to ask when it makes sense, when it doesn't make sense, and so on. Uh, but it can be used. And the other, but the major problem is uh, in the United States and in Britain and other powerful states uh, to just uh, educational and organizational act actions to try to bring things to the point where the governments will change policy. In this respect, the South African model is uh, of some relevance. Uh, it took a long time before the Western powers uh, significantly opposed apartheid. Uh, it was many years of education and organization. Uh, the, the first, uh, the apartheid regime was basically installed in the late 50s, but uh, it was the mid-70s until the United Nations declared an embargo. It was a couple of years after that that uh, what's called the Sullivan Plan was um, initiated a voluntary plan for corporations uh, not to invest if there was racist hiring and so on. Uh, by the mid-1980s, uh, the U.S. Congress was imposing sanctions, which Reagan incidentally uh, disregarded, increased trade with South Africa, increased support for South Africa. Uh, there was, meanwhile, there was, by, by that time, there was almost no public support for apartheid, uh, very different from the situation with regard to Palestine. But by then, uh, pressures were sufficient so that uh, um, th th there were other uh, pressures that nobody wants to talk about. That's Cuba. Uh, Cuba was sending uh, military forces, black soldiers, to first to defend Angola against uh, uh, South African invasion, and they beat them back, which was a major, had a lot of psychological impact in uh, Africa altogether, black and white. Uh, then Cuba played the major role in kicking the South Africans out of Namibia, uh, where they were there in violation of Security Council resolutions. And this went on through the 80s. They were a very significant force. But that force, plus uh, other factors, uh, uh, like the ones I mentioned, the variety of um, sanctions and boycotts and so on, and just growing opposition, uh, led to a situation where, by about 1990, uh, the U.S. changed its position. Uh, it, uh, uh, Mandela was released from Robbins Island. There were some steps towards accommodation. Uh, uh, within a couple of years, apartheid had formally collapsed. Uh, uh, both South African and Western business interests realized that they would be better off if the apartheid regime disappeared, but the 
the social and economic system essentially remained. So you have some black faces and limousines, but pretty much the same system otherwise. And uh, what, what's striking is that it just took a cruci one crucial factor was a change in U.S. policy. It's not the only time. Uh, another dramatic case, uh, it's about 10 years ago, was Indonesia. Uh, Indone the Indonesian invasion of East Timor, which came about as close to genocide as anything in the post-Second World War period, it was strongly supported by the U.S., uh, Britain, uh, other Western countries. It was, there was you know, efforts to create opposition, but didn't have a lot of effect. Uh, in, in the year 1999, uh, atrocities mounted again, but they were ignored. The U.S. and Britain continued to support them. Uh, finally, in September 1999, uh, Clinton, who was then under considerable international pressure and also domestic pressure, some of it popularly mobilized, some of it right-wing Catholics, powerful right-wing Catholic groups, it's a Catholic country. Uh, under those pressures, Clinton simply informed the Indonesian generals that the game is over. They immediately departed. The two days late, earlier, they said, we're never going to leave, it's our country. As soon as they got the orders from Washington, they departed, uh, and a, uh, an Australian-led uh, peacekeeping force could enter unopposed. Uh, well, that shows that's what power is. Mm -hmm. And something like that could happen in Israel-Palestine, but it's going to take a lot of work. Mm -hmm. South Africa, and East Timor, many other cases, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm 